I'm going to be talking about uh, barcoding a collection and specifically a fungal collection. And those of you who may uh, be sitting there in your comfortable kingdoms thinking fungi, well, just reflect on how sad your life would be without the fungi. Okay, some of you had to use anti-dandruff shampoo this morning, that's a bummer. But you had mushrooms, you had bread, and hopefully tonight you will have beer and wine. Without us, you're nowhere. <laughs> um, so I'm from the Westerdijk Fungal Biodiversity Institute. It's uh, more or less in the middle of uh, the Netherlands. Um, some of you may be confused because previously we were known as the CBS. But uh, this year we officially changed our name. It's the Westerdijk year in the Netherlands. Um, in honor of our first director, who was also the first female professor in the Netherlands. A uh, hundred years ago, she became a professor, and exactly on the day, at the same time, on the same pulpit, we changed the name of the institute. So we had a whole year of wonderful celebrations, and I will say something more about her in a little while. Um, the motto of the Institute is to elucidate culture and preserve. And we don't discriminate. We work on all fungi, the most wonderful, wonderful kingdom of all. So um, here we have Johanna Westerdijk with her technicians. Uh, there she is. Uh, this is at the tender age of 22 when she became uh, the first director of the Institute, the post that she had for, I think, 52 years. She trained about 56 PhDs, three of them were South African that came back, and um, uh, Susara Truter, who went to Natal, became the first female dean of agriculture in the world. She trained many PhD students, some who are still professors in the country today, or their students at least. So, uh, wonderful legacy. She's uh, especially famous for working on Dutch elm disease. This is Ophiostoma ulmi at the bottom, being, uh, trans, uh, um, uh, being dispersed by these uh, scoliated beetles, of which Paul likes to hack off one leg. And um, if Paul were to take the gut contents of these beetles, he would have to reflect on the slide that he showed you yesterday. You will remember there was a big insect block, and hiding beneath this block was a smaller block that said fungi. Well, if Paul and Dan were to change the methodology and look at gut contents, all the fungi would reveal themselves and those two blocks would have to change because we are the larger kingdom. <laughs> um, so, uh, Johanna Westerdijk started the collection with a set of about 80 cultures which were collected by uh, Professor Wendt and he went to Indonesia, to Java and brought these cultures back and this was the start of a wonderful collaboration and building this amazing uh, institute. Um, presently, we are the largest uh, living fungal collection in, in the world. We have about uh, 100,000 acquisitions, and we send out probably about 5,000 strains per year uh, globally for research purposes. And um, when Paul started this whole barcoding initiative in 2003, we were fortunate to be involved right from the start, and we set up this uh, automated pipeline which has been running ever since. So barcoding now is part of our whole uh, operation and workflow, and uh, we have managed to barcode the entire collection. So um, this is basically uh, how things work. When when the also all new acquisitions that come into the institute are immediately subjected to barcoding. And we do two loci, namely the ITS and the large subunit, as the large subunit helps us to take things to uh, genus level. And uh, much of our data can be uh, blasted with a range of interlinked uh, databases. So this is uh, very handy for people that uh, need to identify fungi and we also have our own limb system that helps us to track the, uh, the fungi when they come in, the trace files, the extractions, etc., which is quite essential. We're the only kingdom, <coughs> let me repeat that, we're the only kingdom <laughs> where barcoding allowed us to change the code of nomenclature. Mm. So in the fungi, you had this odd situation that um, if a fungus is asexual, 
it got a name. And if it was sexual, it also got a name. We had no way of linking the two. But due to DNA barcoding, we could now see, hey, these things belong together. It's the sexual and the asexual morph of one species. And we managed to change the code so that there would henceforth only be a single genus for every uh, fungal group. Uh, which meant that we really had to establish committees globally that worked on integrating all these sexual and asexual genera. And the debates, the fury, the anger of which name to use. Woo! I will save you all of that, but it, it was delicious. Okay. <laughs> so uh, what made it all possible is that we had this big international uh, uh, consortium of people that uh, debated which gene to use. And after a, a lot of work, we eventually ended up with the ITS, basically because of ease of amplification uh, across the kingdom, knowing, however, that the ITS will only identify around 73% of all the fungi that you will come across. So, um, but even... Uh, with the ITS, we run into massive problems. This is, for instance, the genus Candida uh, in the collection. You will see it's probably about 200 different genera. You know, but these yeasts, morphologically, th there's not that much to go on. So we now desperately need taxonomists to, to work on these fungal groups and to sort out their taxonomy because the barcoding data has revealed that there's a, there's a massive uh, a problem. There's also been several additional papers that have been published that have focused on uh, proposing secondary barcodes to supplement the ITS to get a better species uh, uh, identification. And in the process, of course, we look at the intra and inter-specific uh, variation within taxa to try and uh, uh, find these uh, uh, primers. The most important paper was this one of Benjamin Stillo, which um, evaluated a range of primers and came up with a set of elongation factor, uh, which really worked very well to, to supplement the, uh, the ITS. So this is all collection stuff, and you may be wondering, how does this impact on research? And I've included two examples just to show you what, what we have been doing. The first example is uh, industrial mycology. And this is a project that was funded for about 10 years by the Sloan Foundation, looking at indoor air quality. So sitting here in this um, healthy uh, room, I think the bat from this morning has left. It didn't like fungi that much. Uh, it's amazing how long that bat flew. I was trying to time it, but I got tired. So um, in such a building, uh, a square cubic meter will have probably around a thousand fungal spores. If this was a sick building, then you get to 3,000. And then you probably have this uh, uh, bathroom. Uh, thank you, Paul, for that picture. I, uh, <coughs> I think you have a problem, though, but uh, yeah. Okay, so, um, and if this is your house, then, then there's real issues. And those of you who, who are out there, um, uh, looking at the animals, I want you to spare uh, a minute of thought for the dung. Because if you were to look at the uh, dung, the elephant dung, the zebra dung, you will find different species of chaetomium. These are thermotolerant fungi. They love the heat. That's why they survive in the dung. And if you incubate the dung, you get these beautiful fungi coming out. And they're all different. And uh, this is just one complex of chaetomium. Um, a fascinating fungus because it breaks down cellulose. And um, the, the spores look relatively similar, but they're all different species. And without barcodes, there's no way that you will really be able to accurately uh, identify them. And on the wall in Paul's bathroom, we also see a lot of the genus Cladosporium. And here we have another species that used to be one, uh, Tlarosporium tlarosporioides, but with barcodes we could see that this is actually assemblage of 20 odd different species. So many species that are morphologically almost indistinguishable. I won't go the route of Dan Jansen to point to two little white dots that are supposed to touch or not, but I leave that to him. <laughs> When we look at agriculture, I have another example for you, and uh, that was a very successful project, uh, QBall, the Quarantine Barcode of Life, which was f uh, funded in the EU, also with a large uh, consortium, focusing on quarantine organisms, and in that we also did uh, the fungi. 
And I've got one example which I thought I would include um, for you because there are many South Africans in the audience. So what's one of your biggest export uh, products? Don't think about music now, think about food, okay? And then you would think, well, citrus. I think that's around eight, 900 million per year. And what's one of the biggest uh, impediments to trade in citrus? If that citrus were to come into Rotterdam uh, Harbor and it would have these uh, citrus black spot on, on the fruit, that boat goes back. So it's a massive, massive quarantine issue. So um, what we knew uh, by using barcoding is that there are several species of Philosticta, the fungus that causes the disease. There are several species of Philosticta that can cause disease on different citrus types, okay? So um, I've had a postdoc, uh, uh, Italian guy, Vladi, and Vladimiro was running around in um, uh, all uh, southern areas of, of Europe where citrus is grown, collecting fungi on citrus. And because we don't discriminate, I told him, Vladi, collect everything, you know? So we were just collecting everything and we were happily isolating all the fungi. And of course, everything we isolate, we barcode. So much to our shock and horror, we isolated the quarantine organism which was supposed to not be present in Europe. And I say to Vladi, well, this can't be right, you know. Go back, go have a look at those citrus trees because uh, this, is the, this is the serious quarantine pathogen. <laughs> you know, we found it in several places in, in, in Europe. We even found both mating types. So, you know, um, went back, there was absolutely no sign of disease. And we found this thing on litter. We would never, ever have found it had we not subjected all our isolates to DNA barcoding. So this major quarantine organism, which is used as a trade impediment, is actually present in Europe. So uh, after we published this paper, we were interrogated by quarantine officials, and I thought we were going to be shot. But fortunately, we managed to get, uh, get off in the end. Um, but it just shows you the organism is there, the climate is not suitable, so the disease ne never manifests in, in the field. So you will, if you were to go and visually inspect and look for the disease, you will never find it. But the fungus has probably been there 100 or more years. So that's but one application in agriculture where barcoding is really going to make a massive change. Um, Obviously, when we identify these fungal species, we need to have a concept of, of uh, how to, to distinguish uh, the taxa. And we use an integrated uh, approach using a consolidated species concept with the barcodes, the morphology, and the ecology to get you accurate species identification. Depending on the family where we work, different uh, barcodes are applied. And we see that even within some fungal families, different genera within the family have a different rate of evolution. And the same primers won't necessarily be the optimal primers across all genera in the family, depending how diverse the family is, of course. Um, we've also very successfully used barcoding to highlight um, biodiversity to the normal uh, lay person. Because, you know, uh, all of you look at the cuddly little bear or you look at the beautiful flower and none of you care about the fungi. But if the, the flower goes into extinction, uh, so does the fungus. So um, with the initiative which we call Fungal Planet, we have been um, publishing these novel fungi and showing the environment where they have been collected. So um, I'm just showing a few that, that came from South Africa, showing you the, the different beautiful environments where we've been collecting these fungi. And if you were to see the environment, you will never think fungus because many of these fungi are hidden inside the plants, you know, and you will, you will normally never see them. So it's only if you culture them and look at them, then you will see the true beauty of what's in that stump. But you know, you see what you want to see. You want to see that dead tree lying over there. You don't want to see the fungus. So uh, I've got to show this to you. I mean, here's the fungus on this boabab tree. Most of you will look and say, boabab tree. None of you will say, geez, boabab tree with a lot of fungus. You know, so... Uh <laughs>
<laughs> we have to think differently about biodiversity. And even on these beautiful proteas down in the Cape, they're full, full, full. The Feinbos is a wonderful treasure trove of fungi. You won't believe how many new fungi are down in the Feinbos. So lots of fantastic uh, uh, species waiting. Even on these succulent plants, they, they're full of uh, uh, fungus. So we've also been using barcoding to revise our taxonomy. This is a paper just published about genera of ascomycetes, so several gen uh, thousand genera of ascomycetes, and because of barcoding, we can now start to incorporate type strains and barcodes where these are known of these different genera. A big problem is that, um, you know, we've got 18,000 genera in the kingdom fungi, about 8,000 are in current use, and people have no real idea of the genetic placement of these genera because most of them are not known from DNA. So this for us is a, is a massive uh, uh, issue. So we started the series of papers, the genera of fungi, which allows us to physically hunt down the type species. Sometimes I put out a reward poster with money and I say, bring me his head for DNA extraction and preservation, you know, and it works. People find these things in the, if you know the host and the country where it was described from, you can frequently find the fungus. It's still sitting there on the tree. Here I am, you know, I'm on the wanted poster, I'm famous. <laughs> um, We've also used this concept uh, for genera of phytopathogenic fungi, a series of papers which we call GOFI, and I will show you what we are actually doing. So um, this is one example, the genus uh, Colletotricum, and uh, in this approach um, you have uh, the synonymy, you have the classification, the type of course, uh, the barcodes at uh, generic level, the barcodes at species level, descriptions, uh, other details, literature, uh, what they look like, and most important of all, um, the table of accepted species. So the genus Colletotricum has got more than a thousand species names, but only very few have been barcoded. So for Colletotricum, you need a set of six barcodes to get your accurate species identification. And for each genus then that we treat, we add this um, table of accepted uh, species, which is really essential. Um, and then plant pathologists can um, deal with these genera and they know which are the accepted species in the genus. Um, so more or less 20 genera or so per paper will, will be treated and, and published as such. And for plant pathology, this will be a massive contribution. And now back to the collection. So what have we been doing? I mentioned that um, we sequenced uh, all of the um, uh, collection and um, we have uh, in the process uh, come up with uh, thousands of barcodes and we, we had to first ask the question um, how could we cluster these barcodes and to do that uh, the bioinformatics team have uh, um, developed specific uh, algorithms that they could use um, in a fast way to, to cluster all these uh, uh, barcodes and when you have a, a lot of say for instance yeast isolates to take those with similar um, barcodes and put them together in the same uh, bin. And what we have uh, been working on are two data sets. The one is uh, uh, yeasts and uh, the second one is uh, filamentous fungi. So we've split them in two uh, groups uh, because it was easier to deal with it. And um, in both groups you have the, the type strains and um, then you also have the validated isolates which aren't uh, type strains. So these are the two uh, data sets that, that we've been um, working with. And if you were to look at the filamentous fungi, you will see these are uh, four major classes of filamentous fungi, and looking at the colors, you will see that there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of taxonomy that's wrong that needs to be uh, cleaned up. So based on the data that we uh, generated, um, here on the left we have the yeasts, on the right you have the filamentous fungi, um, and this is uh, um, uh, 
uh, ITS, the first two columns, LSU, the last two. The first one is type, and this is uh, validated strains that, that have been released. And the orange part in each shows um, where the ITS or the LSU wasn't able to distinguish species. So you see that the ITS does far better um, in the yeast than they do in the filamentous fungi. So um, this, this was uh, not something I, uh, we expected, but um, even the combined data set of ITS LSU works better in yeast than uh, um, in filamentous fungus. And also we found that um, the separation of genus, family, uh, order, and class is far better in yeasts than in filamentous fungi, suggesting that um, the higher level hierarchy in the fil filamentous fungi is really, uh, um, it needs a lot of attention. So we need taxonomists to, to uh, work on that. And part of the reason probably why uh, the yeasts are in a much better position is um, this is the, the barcodes uh, um, of the Basidiomycetes yeast. Look at the red line. This was before we revised the taxonomy and the, the um, uh, blue line is after they've been revised. So the yeast have been much improved in taxonomy. That's why the results are far better. So um, take home messages from the collection barcoding is that um, uh, the ITS and the LSU works very well. There's uh, uh, different uh, threshold levels for yeast and for filamentous fungi, they're slightly higher than for the yeast. Using these results and comparing it to the UNITE database, it appears that the thresholds being used by UNITE are maybe a, a, a bit low. Um, the ITS outperformed the LSU uh, for species identification. Of course, the LSU is much better for generic uh, class uh, classification. So based on this uh, first work, we've managed to release a whole bunch of yeast isolates, and we are now busy with a second paper that will release the filamentous fungi barcode. So this is the first one on, on the yeast that, that we published last year. So another thing that we've been doing is we've been using barcoding in citizen science. And um, I was always very envious listening to Paul and seeing what he's doing in Canada. I thought, hell, we, we also have to do something. So what we've done in, um, in our Vesterdijk year celebrations in the museum, we had uh, a beautiful fungal exhibitions of all the, uh, the things that, that her and her group did. And there were lots of school uh, children that could come, different schools came on different days, and they were exposed to the fungi. Um, they could have drag races in these tubes, betting on which fungus would grow the fastest. They could make little models of the fungi. So it was, it was really uh, very exciting for them. And uh, we were all there um, helping them and showing them. And um, when they left, they got a little kit to take home and the kit consisted of two tubes and when they went home they sampled soil from their gardens and mailed it back to the institute. We then isolated all the fungi from the soils and this was part of the project which we called Wereld Farmer Skimmel Met Je Naam which means world famous a fungus with your name. And the idea is that if your soil sample from your garden has a new species, we will name it after you. So there was a lot of excitement. There was a website where the kids could go and they could click on their address and see what we have found. This is a bit of an old slide. There were, um, there were many more samples than this. And um, they could see what are the top species that are being isolated. We gave the fungi different strengths, and there was a card game that they could play, and you know, like the lion is the king, and we had different fungi that were kings. So, um, and uh, two months ago, we handed out the first certificates. There, the parents and the kids getting their uh, fungi that have been named after them. And this was on television, it was in the newspapers. Man, they were happy, they were so blown away. And uh, the only other thing that we could find that, that could possibly top this is when uh, seeing all the uh, parents' faces when we introduced them to the unique beer that we were also making from yeast. So this will be our next citizen science projects because I, I, I thought that the fathers also wanted to be more uh, involved and some of the mothers uh, who like beer. So our next 
citizen science project will be sampling yeasts from, from trees. They will hug a tree, take a swap, and send this in. We isolate the yeast. Then uh, you can uh, buy a ticket to get on the panel to select the different beers which will make it to the uh, market. And we will try to make six beers so that you have a six-pack with six different yeasts, with six different stories. So the first beer that we made was in honor of Johanna Westerdijk, and uh, the beer is called Skoene Geest. There you see her with a beer. She liked the beer. Um, and she had a motto, Werken in Feesten vorm Skoene Geesten. So work hard, play hard, and that's a healthy spirit. So Healthy Spirit is the first beer that uh, we made in honor of Vesterdijk. So another thing that we're doing with the barcodes, we're helping um, or we're using the barcodes to help us select uh, isolates of fungi that could potentially produce uh, interesting metabolites, looking for novel antibiotics that could address key societal uh, uh, challenges. And this we're doing in association with other labs on Utrecht campus. Um, so hopefully this will also lead to some very exciting uh, results. To round off with, this was the institute, I think, more or less 1919. There you see Johanna sitting in the middle, very prominent uh, lady. Um, this was Heis Madura, where the institute was. And two months ago, we revealed or opened our new research facility, and this is it now. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Pedro. Do we have any questions? Thank you for a wonderful talk. I, I'm wondering if you've been to Micropia, the, the museum in Amsterdam, because they have some nice fungal displays as well. I figured that might be the case. That's excellent. Uh, no, I do, I do have a scientific question, which is you mentioned thermophilic fungi. And I'm curious um, how thermophilic they are and how well do you think they've been sampled? Globally. Um, the, uh, there's some labs that are focused on thermophilic fungi. And um, together with the Chinese Academy of Science, we have got a, a Chinese uh, scientist now working on the, uh, the genus Chaitomium specifically. And some of them grow at 40 odd degrees. And um, they extremely interesting fungi because during the Second World War, when the uh, Allied troops took all their jeeps out of the bunkers and they closed the tarpaulin, there was no tarpaulin anymore because the fungus had eaten all of that. So they love cellulose. That's why industry is so interested in them. And um, I already thought that uh, if I were to be in South Africa now, I would uh, have a student uh, do a PhD on dung. In Kruger would be excellent, where you can look at the different herbivores and sample all uh, th those dung for, for different thermophilic species. It's a beautiful project, and it would deliver lots. So in the Chaitomiaceae, there's now we know that it's not one genus. There are many, many different genera, and the different genera at different properties which will be really interesting for uh, uh, industry. So having the barcodes, you can get to the right genus, and uh, those may be the properties that, that industry wants. So very exciting, lots to do. Could you comment on the impact of your research on the phyllosticta on the uh, citrus industry? Can we now export our citrus to Europe with no impediments? And did the pathogen come from Europe, and how does it relate to the uh, domestication and uh, cultivation of citrus around the world? Mm. <laughs> you were only allowed one question. <laughs> well, um, uh, we think that uh, uh, phyllosticta came from Asia. That's where citrus came from, and the most diversity, uh, when we look at the number of clones, we seem to find in Asia. Um, from there, it was introduced into uh, Australia, and um, also somehow it came to South Africa. Um, the clones that we have in um, Europe uh, do not appear to be the ones that are in South Africa, um, but uh, there was trade between Australia and I think Portugal long ago, and there's one clone in Portugal that we find in Australia. 
So um, I think if what we actually need is a Chinese student or Asian student to, to intensively sample citrus in Asia because you will probably find more species and you will find more clones. And that will help us to, to uh, uh, trace its, its uh, entry into, for instance, Florida a, a few years ago, etc. And um, what's interesting, it's, it's not uh, um, the same clones that are everywhere. Um, in Europe, we, we do find uh, both mating types, but we don't find them together. Um, uh, what this means, I don't know, but it, it, it appears that uh, there may be no sexual uh, outcrossing going on, and this is probably, again, linked to climate. The implications are, are huge, um, but EPO, the European uh, Plant Protection Organization, has not reacted officially to this uh, publication yet, and it's still listed as a quarantine organism on their lists. I don't know what they're going to do. They just wrote a whole full report. We had a lot of uh, quarantine officers and lawyers and stuff. Uh, it was like an interrogation, you know. Where did you find this? On what did you find this, you know? So um, we found it on litter. There was never any disease. And we went back to check. There's still no disease. So I think that this uh, fungus can somehow survive as an endophyte in Europe. And uh, the climate is such that um, disease does not develop. If you look at the South African situation, in uh, um, Mpumalanga, Gauteng, wherever um, the disease is, is rife, it's, it's common. If you go down to the Cape, there's no disease. The Cape is a Mediterranean climate. I bet you that if I can sample the Cape for citrus, I will find the fungus as an endophyte living there and no symptoms.